Good afternoon and welcome to Cooper Hewitt. I'm Caitlin Condell, the Associate Curator and Head of Drawings, Prints, and Graphic Design here at Cooper Hewitt. Today marks the official opening of the exhibition Nature, Cooper Hewitt Design Triennial, co-organized by Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum and Cube Design Museum in Kirkrada, Netherlands. On view concurrently, the show's both open to the public today. The exhibition allows audiences in both the US and Europe to experience the work simultaneously, the first time ever for each of our institutions. This triennial seeks to inspire ideas, collaboration, and dialogue to address the most significant environmental and humanitarian issues of our time, and I'm excited to begin this dialogue with the conversation today. We are fortunate to have two of the designers featured in the exhibition with us to discuss their inspiring practices. I will introduce them both briefly, and they will speak about their own work before we come together for what I know will be a lively discussion. Shahar Livnay is a conceptual material designer, born in Israel and based in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Her lifelong fascinations in nature, biology, and science and philosophy developed into the intuitive material experimentation during her studies at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. She was recently named one of the 100 most influential international talents in the creative industry by Icon Design Magazine and was nominated for the 2018 Beasley Design of the Year Award. Charlotte McCurdy is an American interdisciplinary designer and researcher based in Brooklyn. She is a global security fellow at the Rhode Island School of Design with the support of the MacArthur Foundation and also a member of the New Museum's cultural incubator, New Inc. She holds a Master of Industrial Design from RISD and a Bachelor of Arts in Global Affairs from Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Charlotte and Shahar. No? Okay, good. Okay, so the conventional story we tell each other about climate change is that it's a problem of burning fossil fuels for the production of electricity and for transport. It then follows that what we need to do is to reduce our consumption of those fuels to reduce our release of those gases. It then follows that you and I should feel guilty. Our unwillingness to sacrifice our modern standards of living causes us to contribute to polluting a pristine nature. What this story misses, among other things, is the third of emissions that come from the chemistry of stuff. In the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you about a category of emissions that most people don't talk about. Emissions not from burning fossil fuels, but from the intrinsic chemistry of things like buildings and plastic bottles. And then I'm going to tell you why adding these emissions to the scope of your concern is a cause for hope, not further despair. So, Let's look at the materials currently complicit in climate change. We're talking primarily about cement, steel, and plastic. These materials are carbon emitters like fossil fuels because they are fossilized life. In the terms of my work, they are ancient sunlight. So what do I mean by ancient sunlight? Big, beautiful, carbon-based molecules are how life stores the energy of the sun. Let's follow the sunlight of plastic for a minute. So photosynthesizing organisms hundreds of millions of years ago took in sunlight and carbon from the ancient atmosphere, and built the carbon-rich molecules of their little bodies, which then uh, settled to the ocean floor and gradually accumulated into carbon-rich sedimentary rock, which then went to just the right sequence of pressure, heat, and capture to produce petroleum. We then take up that slurry of carbon molecules, separate them by length, break them apart, recombine them into all of our plastics. This process releases carbon all along its chain. Looking at these materials as ancient sunlight raises a logical question. What would happen if we made them out of present tense sunlight? If we took the carbon from our current atmosphere and the sunlight we have right now, we could, make, we could not only reduce our dependence on ancient carbon, we could, if we do it right, store our current carbon in our materials. And this isn't science fiction. Um, this raincoat is made from a plastic I developed that's made entirely from marine algae, macroalgae, and it is carbon negative. It is made from naturally sequestered carbon. And I'm far from alone. That's where this gets exciting. 
Um, I'm actually going to go back for a second. Um, there are breakthroughs happening in biology and catalytic chemistry in real time, and we increasingly have the technology to make new and familiar materials carbon negative. For example, there's a company you might have heard of um, that through one of their partners is sitting on a patent that allows them to make PET, standard plastic bottle plastic, entirely out of plant sugars. But faced with a com conversation dominated by biodegradability, there's not really space to introduce good old PET, even if this time it's entirely petroleum free. This one company produces three million metric tons of plastic a year. To put that in perspective, if all of that plastic was in the form of 20 ounce soda bottles, we stack them into a cube the size of the new museum, down on Bowery Street, this one company produces 10 new museums a day, every day, every year. PET is more than 60% carbon by mass. So we have the technology to make carbon negative materials, but what's missing is desire and a fundamental understanding of the complicity of materials and climate change. This is a design challenge. We're on the edge of a revolution and we don't have the vocabulary to ask for it. I see a future where the buildings that shelter me and the shirt on my back have a desirable impact on the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere and where we can all re-engage or engage for the first time with climate change because we can touch it and have hope. I'm Charlotte McCurdy and After Ancient Sunlight is an umbrella project that builds a path to a future where culture can be a carbon sink. In a paralyzed policy environment, we need a citizen-led movement to pave the way to a market-led inevitability. This to me is political realism. It's happening already with solar, it can happen with materials too, and it has to. So I offer you my guiding design question for this project. What would it feel like to get back into a present tense relationship with the sun? I hope you'll join me in working towards a future where we can find out. Hello, so uh, now to something maybe a little bit different. <laughs> so as uh, Caroline uh, introduced me, my name is Shachar Ripen, I'm a conceptual material designer. I'm gonna briefly ex explain what is a conceptual material designer because probably you're used to hear about material designers and that they design uh, systems, how to deal with materials or they design new, new type of composite materials or for example, PET, uh, sugar cane, sugar based uh, plastics. So it's more like engineering materials, but I see it from a conceptual way. So for me, every material is a carrier or a narrative. It's a storyteller. And I'm trying through design to attract people to listen to this story. Is it by interacting? Is it by looking? So I really believe that design can also be uh, a mental practice. Uh, I'm very, very much um, uh, with the project I'm presenting here, I'm uh, kind of looking to the Anthropocene. Maybe some of you heard about it. It's the new geological age that we live in. Um, there was a panel this morning, uh, kind of ah, a bit later. <laughs> there's going to be a panel later um, digging into it um, if it really should be an official uh, geological era or, or not. Uh, I really believe it is. Uh, some, uh, some people say that it started when when humans started agriculture, so when we started changing um, uh, the landscape, or some people say they started uh, with atomic experiments, so we left uh, atomic residues um, in the earth. Uh, what is really interesting for me about the Anthropocene is that because I look in a really big um, time scales, geological time scales, um, it's a, just one little second in the lifespan of the Earth. So if you can look at here, it's like this little, little dot, it's only like a split second of the life uh, that existed here and will probably exist after us. Um, I want to talk about nature uh, in a different way. So the way we see nature is usually very romantic. We're always imagining when somebody is telling us nature, we think about uh, fresh meadows or trees, and we don't see it, any, and it's not really like that anymore. So since the Industrial Revolution, nature started to become completely different. Can we call it already next nature? Because it takes to itself human-made materials. We extract it, but we also bring back into it. So 
nature nowadays looks more like the pictures that we see everywhere about plastic pollution, sea full of plastics, rivers of plastic pollution, um, extraction of materials. Um, so as I said, uh, some people assume that um, they say that the uh, Anthropocene era started when we started nuclear bomb tests. And for me, it was a really interesting moment because um, it created a new material, kind of a natural way. So it, you can't really call it a human-made material, but more like a naturally occurring material. Uh, this is Trinitite, so it was a residue that was left um, in the test area of the bomb uh, Trinity. I think it was here in the USA or in Mexico, probably, I think. I'm not sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it was a new type of a material that happened because of us, but in a very natural way. So I'm really trying to figure out, also with my research, also the way I work as a designer, like what are the uh, borders between man-made and natural? And I found out that it's very blurry nowadays. So we can't really say, oh, this is man-made, this is natural. Uh, another narrative carrying material, which is naturally occurring, but it's kind of man-made, uh, it's Fordite or uh, Motor Agat. And it occurred, uh, it started happening um, because of uh, the motor industry. Um, in Detroit mainly, uh, they found out that um, in the past we used to color uh, cars by uh, coating them with a mile, putting them in the oven, and then taking it out. And it was laying on kind of a rail. And what the workers in the factory started to notice that there's this material that accumulates, all the colors are accumulating on the rails. And they thought, wow, this is really beautiful material. We should, probably there is a potential to it. And what happened today is that because this technology is not, uh, is not happening anymore, we're not using this technology to paint cars, it doesn't occur. So people are selling those kind of materials for really a lot of money because of the potential of them. And they're really looking at it almost as precious stones. So this is kind of what I'm trying to explain when I'm talking about a narrative carrying materials. This is a time capsule of a technology that we don't have anymore. And it's really, you can even look at it in, in a political sense or into, um, yeah, like what was the colors that were um, really, um, uh, really popular in the certain factory. You can really trace back um, the economical and the political uh, changes uh, that occurred at that time through this material. Um, but the material that I took uh, as an inspiration for my project Metamorphism, which I'll talk about uh, in a second, uh, it's, the it's the newest type of rock occurring on the face of the earth, which is called Plastiglomerate. It was found in Hawaii, uh, in a certain area called Camilo Beach, um, and the sand there is very oversaturated already with plastic particles because of the gyres and the movement of the ocean, so it could be plastic that arrives from really far away. And uh, the researchers who found uh, those plastics they were really amazed because it's already a plastic that uh, take part with other natural materials. It's really accumulate and becomes a new type of rock without any human intention. Um, they found out also they buried quite deep, so they really call it the marker of the Anthropocene that will probably stay longer than what we assume will happen to plastic. So to go to my, my project and what I actually did. Um, so for my graduation project at the Design Academy, as I said, I'm a very material, I'm a material girl. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was fascinated by the occurrence of plastic glomerate and this idea of transformation of nature. Um, and also I was a bit sick of uh, the way we treat plastic because it became really like the black sheep of humanity. It became like the worst thing that we can talk about. Every time we talk about pollution, every time we talk about climate change, we start to talk about plastic. And I saw so much, um, so much negative uh, feelings towards plastic that I wanted really to see, maybe there is something else, maybe we can talk about it in a different way. And the moment you start talking about it in a bigger uh, frame, as, ge as a geologist that I spoke to, uh, the world is not gonna give a damn about us. So for us, it's really a big thing, but if we're talking in a, geological scales, time scales, it's not gonna bother the Earth, it's just gonna take it to itself. So what is actually metamorphism? 
Um, it's a geological term that speaks about, uh, that refers to uh, heat and pressure that are occurring to materials when they're buried in a certain point. Uh, when we talk about geological uh, uh, processes, we think immediately like really big uh, depth, really big heat, really big pressure, but it starts from 250 degrees and one bar, which is quite light, and it's very possible to make it in a, in a lab environment. Um, and what they, but how geologists refers to it, they say that rocks start to act like plastic, that they stretch and they become malleable, and they um, they change, and that's how also you get different minerals. And I thought this transformation it can be really interesting if we think about it about the man-made materials that we put in it. So I started my research by really being just going out doing a field research. Uh, I went to the beach in the Netherlands and in Israel, just collecting the plastic that uh, went out of the ocean. So it's already plastic that went through some natural processes. I didn't want to work with new plastic. Um, and I found this uh, little piece of uh, material, uh, which is kind of, it, it is plastic glomerate. Um, you don't, I don't know if you really can see it in the, uh, in the picture, but uh, it already had a few, um, uh, animals like from the sea starting to grab into it. So it really became part of nature. Nature. So I collected the plastic, I collected the sediments which are around it. So kind of like the suspicious, uh, like the main uh, suspects of what will happen. And um, I wanted to talk about, uh, I wanted to refer to the field of speculative design. Because again, as I said, I don't want to stay in a very small time frame, the one, the one we're really like talking about now, but I want to look in a bigger scale. Um, so I looked into a speculative uh, design from Dun and Rabi. It's a couple, it's uh, two designers from the uh, UK. And they came up with this uh, term. And it's talking about different uh, possible narratives. So it can be either uh, an alternate narrative. So for example, if somebody else, uh, if Hitler wouldn't win, uh, would win the World War II, how the world would look like. So to uh, kind of uh, illustrate that so we can learn for, from the way, we're use, the way we're acting now to learn what would be a possible future. Or you can do also look at things that really happens at the now and um, uh, and create some kind of like, almost like a detective. You take hints, you take trends, you look at things that occur, and you can build a, a, a very possible future. And what I did, I worked with geologists, and also I interviewed the person who actually found the plastic glomerate, and I asked them, what can happen to plastic? What really will happen to plastic? And of course they said that because it's uh, existing in all kinds of uh, of environments that mummify it, for example, landfills, which are mummifying materials, or for example, at the bottom of the sea where it's a very muddy environment and the fossilize, it's gonna exist way longer than those 1,000 years we say that they can uh, exist in. Um, I'm also very interested in philosophy of design and eco-philosophy. So a lot of times when I create an object, I refer uh, to a philosopher or a philosophical term. term. Um, one of the most uh, beautiful essays I wrote was uh, by Ronald Barthes, and he wrote in his book, Myth About Plastic, that plastic is an essentially alchemical, alchemical substance, more than substance. Sub plastic is the very idea of its infinite transformation. And I think that's how nature really works. It doesn't work with good or bad, it just transforms. It just digests. Um, the material I created, this speculative future material that plastic glomerate and all the plastic that we create will transform into in thousands of years, millions of years, uh, is created from a few different materials. So one of them is marble, calcium carbonate, which also exists in plastic as a whitener. So it's already in the same environment, but it also exists at the bottom of the sea. So it's also the thing that fossilize uh, animals. So I was thinking, okay, I have to work with a material that probably will be in the same environment. But when I look at the way we extract marble and the way we treat resources, natural resources, it's really connected immediately to the age of man, the way we change landscapes. And I thought it's a very strong narrative that I can kind of inject into my own material. The second material I work with, it's called uh, Mindstone. 
and it comes uh, from very deep in the ground when we do uh, mining for uh, metals or for coal. And we bring this ancient materials into the face of the earth, so into our time. So except for being very poetic and very philosophical uh, about it, like, oh, the, this man-made landscape, I could also work with very organic materials or materials that are not polluted by humans, but will come in touch with this polluted material, the plastic. Uh, and of course, uh, I work with plastic from the oceans and uh, from landfills. So I couldn't legally go to a landfill. So what I started doing, I'm working now with a few, a few um, uh, companies that they do recycling for household uh, plastic. And they give me the plastic they're, they're going to send into landfills. So it's a plastic they don't want to or they can't recycle. So it's going to be anyway deep in the ground. Um, my material, when I uh, use metamorphism on it in a kind of a lab um, environment, it really becomes like clay. Uh, it's a very hot clay, so I have to wear gloves when I work with it. But I thought it's quite amazing because it's a really different way of the way we're interacting with plastic nowadays. It's almost like a craft person. It's almost like in, in the ancient way we used to extract materials from the earth and really connect to them. So maybe it will become the new clay of the future. What can I do with it? What will be the value of it? Uh, I created this kind of, you'll see it maybe upstairs later, or you already saw it. Um, it's kind of a little um, worshipy, kind of a mysterious object. And the purpose of doing it was, um, is that we're kind of worshipping materials. I took the idea from uh, Lacan, which is a philosopher, and he called it the object petit a. So it's the object that we'll never be able to have. We're always worshiping it. We always want to have it. If you have 10,000 cars, you'll always want to have the newest car. And I think also that's the way we're treating nature. We always want to control it. We always want to modify it. And plastic as well, it's, we always want to make it stronger, better, faster, produced. So for me, that's my way of communicating this story to you, the crowd. Uh, the second project, I, the second object I made, and it's always also upstairs, uh, it's a kind of an archetype of a vase. And the idea was to tell the story of the past materials that we work with, how we used natural materials, and what will be the new natural materials in thousands of years when we extract landfills as if they were quarries or mines for precious materials. And uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so both of the projects that are showcased in the triennial grew out of your graduate work in your design programs. And I was really interested in the fact that both of you chose to name these materials that you were working with. And in talking to you right in advance of the show, I learned that since the time of your creation, the naming of them has been more controversial. You've each had different kinds of experiences around the questions that just naming these materials have provoked. So I hoped you could both tell us a little bit about what that experience has been. Yes, yeah, we, we spoke earlier about it, and it was really interesting to find uh, a common experience with Charlotte, uh, Charlotte that um, when you name a material, immediately you get uh, responses from uh, companies and people who want to use it for uh, construction, for interior design. And I really became very defensive with this material because for me it's a very precious to keep this narrative, to keep this philosophical and poetic idea of speculative design. I, I was really protecting of it from not becoming something that we just use to build. I want to keep it as something that is not really happening now, that it will happen in the future. So of course you can't use it for building if it's not there, there yet. Yeah, I mean that's exactly um, to my experience as well, that when you name something, it, people want assume it's you're trying to commercialize it and that it's something that will participate in the economy. Um, but I think both of our projects are much more interested in the storytelling work that materials can do. And in some ways, it's an interesting um, shift in the expectations of what design is and what design can do and like the work that design is supposed to do. I feel like it's a slightly older or more conservative model of what designers are doing to say, like, great, like, what's put a price tag on it? Like, let's, when is it in Target? And it's like, that's not all design uh, 
functions at within society these days, um, and perhaps not where it's most needed given the problems that we face. You both chose to make objects that have a familiarity that reference experiences we have in our day-to-day -day lives. So why did you make those choices when you were making these works? Well, I kind of use archetypes as a way to communicate to the crowd as kind of an invitation to look closer and try to understand. And one of those techniques is like, for example, to take an archetype which is very known in uh, one material that is from in our environment, for example, what I said about the clay, and the moment you transform it into a different material, it gets a new meaning. And I think that's also, again, about, about looking in a new way into design, that it's more of a tool for discussion than really a material that you can use. And it's also a bit of a criticism about like why every material that we make we have to use. So yeah, for me, for me it's a kind of like a, a gateway, an invitation for people. And I would say um, in working with this material, in early stages, I would often get feedback of like, like why not get, make futuristic aesthetics? Like what, what are the aesthetics native to this particular material? And while that's a totally valid and important inquiry, the, the goal of the project was really around um, addressing climate change and addressing that the tools for combating climate change are already here. And so having the aesthetics be very familiar, very normal, and show that this is not it's not some far off future in which we solve and work on these problems that like it, it's actually in the present and to make that really tangible and inherent to the way the design was conceived top to bottom was really important to me. Um, we were talking about the Anthropocene, which some many scientists believe is the geological age that we're living in. And both of you made work that talked about geological time in a large sense. When you're making work that's very specific to this moment, how is, how is your experience of thinking about time, both looking backward in the geological ages and also forward thinking, impacting how you view your own work and also the, the future of design? Um, I would say I have a specific thought that connects to Shahar's project. I'm okay. butchering your name, I'm sorry. Um, but that uh, in looking through, in looking at carbon from a very literal sense and like, focusing on the atoms, like where are they, where were they, where did they come from? I found this piece of the story of geologic time of carbon emissions that was really striking and beautiful to me, which is that we're not the first form of life to change the climate. That 90% uh, of our coal comes from this one moment when plants developed the ability to produce lignin. And it took 100 million years for other organisms to figure out how to break it down. And so similarly with plastic, like it's an incredibly powerful, energy-dense material. It's part of na nature now, and it's sort, of, it's sort of up to the cycles and the systems and the forces that include organisms, but also include inanimate objects and forces like to determine what will be, retrospectively, will be the way this era looks. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's um, this idea of that every material carries its past, but also its future. It has a potential for future processes. And for me, looking in a very big time scale, I want us to zoom out because I feel that now we're very, as I said, we really made uh, plastic like the source of all evil almost, or like the cause of, of every pollution. And I want people to get to take a step back to look at it from a different scale. And again, it's like geologists, they don't look at those things in that way. And I think when you look in a different perspective about nature and not very humanistic uh, perspective, you get new new thoughts and new ideas and how we should treat nature as well and how nature works around us. Have either of you encountered resistance about the materials? And I'm sure with plastic, which is particularly controversial, thinking about its future use, how it might age in our society, but also, Charlotte, what you've experienced in having these conversations over the last year. Yeah, I, I had a lot of uh, kind of confrontations with people. I think I... Also with my other project, I, I maybe I'm looking for it, <laughs> not uh, not on purpose. But that for me, this is the purpose for me as a designer. When I see people start to talk about it, I I received a few times like people saying yes, yes, but what is your opinion? And I say my opinion, my job as a designer is to let you develop your own opinion. So I take kind of a step backward. I'm making an amoral 
uh, perspective, so you can find your way in it. You can make sense of this, of those huge systems, of your of make your own opinion, do your own research. Don't listen only to something which is on the media, or um, what uh, shadow specialists are saying sometimes. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm really trying to um, take a step back. And usually when I, I'm showing in, a, in an exhibition and the crowd are coming, I'm really enjoying when I see them talking between themselves. I don't take a part in it because I'm just the one who initiated the discussion, but I wanted to develop. It's kind of, I give it to the world back. Um, I'd say the main criticism that I encounter pretty consistently, and I imagine there are people in this audience who are like sitting there feeling it right now, um, is that I'm very conscious of the fact that my project is very techno-optimistic. It falls into a particular way of thinking and talking about addressing climate change. Um, and it sort of gets back to this question of, my goal is about planting an idea and sharing an idea and sharing the sense that one could engage with this topic that they didn't feel like they could engage before. And so to me, it's important to offer, in particular to people of my generation, a hopeful message, even if that comes across as um, overly optimistic at times. But I very firmly believe that that's a very important position to take to get more people at the table, get people at the table who are alienated by words like Anthropocene, um, so that we can actually have more people participating in shaping this scary future that we're living into, um, because it can't be the current, like our, the strategy so far hasn't seemed to work. So as much as there are absolutely things to criticize in the particular frame that I offer, I hope that you can consider it as one complementary approach. It's another thread that maybe will bring other people to the table that aren't currently feeling connected to the narratives that they've been offered so far. I can also add to it because we spoke, uh, we, ha we started to talk about design and how design can uh, really become something else from what we're used to. And I think, uh, for example, in my work, and you're also offering uh, an alternative for plastic, is that the word plastic, although it became very negative, associ uh, very associated to negative uh, ideas. It's something that we interact with every day. So I think it's really helping people to think, oh, what could be a different solution for it? How can we change completely the systems? How can we maybe... Um, I, I sometimes I feel that I give it a kind of um, a moral break to people, that they're like, oh, I have to recycle, then I'm a good person, then I'm nice to the climate change, uh, to the world. And I, I want to tell them this is like a bit of a scheme. There's a beautiful documentary which is called The Recycling Scheme. And people are not looking deep enough to understand that they're just living in their bubble and they're just surrounded by, by information and sometimes they're okay, not lazy, but they're, they don't try to, to go forward. And I think bo by both of our projects, we want people to open up uh, to new ideas and to new possibilities. Uh, we as a curatorial team were really fascinated by the optimism that designers were experiencing in looking at how they were collaborating, partnering with nature, even sort of in the moment where there's an increased awareness of climate change, the impact on our planet that humans make, the UN Climate Report coming out again this week. Um, that optimism, is that something that motivated each of you to approach your, this area of design, or was it from a point of pessimism that your work started? Is the opposite of optimism pessimism or nihilism sometimes? Um, I, I would say that um, my work is more like pragmatic, I'd say, than Shahar's project that she's presenting here. And it is more humanist, it's more human-centric. Um, and I'm comfortable with that because I'm sort of taking a, uh, a stance of um, climate change is here, it's going to suck. Like, the people who suffer are already the most disenfranchised. Uh, all we have control over is severity. And in the logic of the Anthropocene, like we are massively influencing the entire world. Let's get good at it. Like Let's take that seriously instead of retreating from it or pretending that we're not. And that's very difficult to do responsibly and collaboratively and inclusively. 
but we have to try, or what? What's the, what, I, to me, the, the alternative is retiring, repose, recline, and I, dispositionally, I can't sit with that, and I think that there are people like me who feel alienated from this challenge, alienated from the exclusive vocabularies that get used, and want very badly a way to connect with these challenges, but not be told you need to sacrifice, you need to like feel bad every time you take your kids to school, you need to like, that there, there need to be alternative ways of um, caring and doing work. Yeah, I, um, I think, well, I'm not really, not pessimistic or optimistic. Again, I, I'm really trying to look at the bigger picture, like to be really um, um, kind of n normalized. Uh, but um, yeah, well, I'm more trying to uh, give hope as well, like with the way we're dealing with materials. So by taking uh, plastic, which was kind of the first material that we really changed in the chemical sense, like in the chemical state uh, scale, and we it became like this amazing material that we are all using, super exotic, in the 50s, and then later on it became this monster that we can't control anymore. So I'm more trying to say, um, listen, let's stop for a moment before we create other materials. Let's think about about what we're causing and look at plastic as a study case for it. So it really becomes kind of like a thought experiment for future scenarios or for future materials that we're gonna use. So I don't think it's neither not pessimistic or optimistic. I wanna open it up to the audience. There's a question right there. Oh, and if you could wait for the microphone so everyone can hear you. You've, you've both been clear that the value of the materials that you're working with is, for, for the two of you seem to be primarily the uh, ability to talk about ideas. But I'm, I'm not sure if you're both on the same page with regards to do these materials have a life beyond you and beyond these projects of your own or are they just bound up and this is where they belong in, in a philosophical realm as opposed to a material realm? Are you an investor? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'll say this, is that um, one reason why it's important for me to not try to commercialize this particular material is that there's so much greenwashing and so much distrust and so much cynicism. So I feel very clear that if I show up at the table with something for sale, that changes the dynamic of the story I'm trying to tell. Um, and also, there's something very, it's very important. I am very, in my clear vision and hope and sense that carbon negative material culture, um, in terms of built environment, built physical landscape, like how that is really a possibility, I'm very nervous about it be becoming something that one brand or one entity owns as like a like unique value proposition and then no one else can touch it. And so how, how to go about being as open source, as open with these kinds of ideas so that everyone feels like they can be like, wait, I, I make uh, viscose, which is made from trees. Like are there ways that I could change my production process so that it's fully electrified so that this material can be truly renewable for the first time? Like I want that little seed to like travel as much as possible. But I just accept your challenge, for sure. No, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I stay, I stay uh, again, I, I have to, to defend this project as a very philosophical project. Because I think that uh, as a thought experiment, it's really doing its work. It really makes people, a lot of time I have people that they just go, after I tell them the story and they say, wow, you really, I, I need to go home to think about it. And I think that's immediately like, uh, open them up to understanding that um, they need to form their own ideas about 
uh, recycling and about treating materials. So it's not necessarily for commercial use because I, I don't. We're really dependent on plastic. We're not only addicted to it, but we're dependent on it. And people don't understand it when they when they protest against plastic and let's just stop producing it. I think I don't really believe that we can stop producing it at least for the coming hundred years. Maybe we can find. Yeah, we can find uh, replacements, but we're so dependent on it that it will take much longer that we that most people think. And I just want to open their eyes for it. I just want to make the individuals think about it. I don't want to work. I don't make a material which is should be commercialized. And just to like piggyback on that, since like that feeling, I think one in terms of how it's. These materials are part of our near future. There's something really powerful about connecting the really banal asphalt hydrocarbon that's in the road to really precious. It's, I'm, I'm piggybacking on the way you are so good at creating a sense of the preciousness of plastic, that these molecules are incredibly valuable. We need them to make really specific medicines and drugs, and we need to be thinking more carefully about what we do with them, because they are precious, and we need to probably stop paving our roads <laughs> with them. Yeah. No, we're really, we're treating the earth and its resources like it's not precious, but it is. And I think the moment that I even put plastic as a precious material of the future, that will be mined from like the same way that oil, uh, fossil fuels are being mined, it's like changing completely the idea of, of natural resources. And it's a bigger, it's a way bigger story than just plastic pollution and how we treat, how we use plastic. It's really like a story about, wow, we're really like we're here for such a small moment, and we used up the entire Earth for our own needs and wants, way, way more than what we really need. Is there another question from the audience? I see one up here. Uh, hi, so I'm a product design uh, student at Parsons, um, and so one of, in all of my classes, as soon as we started making uh, products and material, the teachers are immediately like, oh, look into these new materials, and it's always about something new that would replace plastic, whatever. Do you think that there is a possibility, like a way that we could start looking back at materials that are already on Earth? Um, like, I found it quite interesting that you started using clay, which is kind of something that a lot of people gave up on um, because plastic is there. So, like, why do we need clay for everything? Do you think that there is a way to look back and start looking at those materials again and th see how they can replace plastic, which is the black sheep? Because you know, bioplastic now is like the miracle thing. It's like, oh, it's the greatest thing. But we still have no idea how it's going to reflect the same way that plastic was the greatest thing. Um, so, yeah, do you think there is a way to look back in something? Uh, definitely, definitely. It's like it's, you just said it, that immediately your teachers are saying to make something new. But why do we have to make and make and make? We have already, there's so much materials that we can look back at. It's like also in design, we're always looking at design history to create the new. So why not look at the potential of things that maybe we looked, um, we looked over? For example, like what you said with ancient sun, I think it's a beautiful idea to look at this perspective, like why we're always looking forward and not backwards as well. For the sake of controversy, I'll disagree. <laughs> um, because I think that there's value in looking backwards for, techn for techniques, materials, but in particular when we're talking about carbon-based materials, we are there's always going to be a trade-off. And within, you, you may, may have encountered like a food versus fuel debate back when ethanol, when plant-based fuels were being introduced and it caused uh, food price spikes that affected people's lives. So a, a thing that you, I try to always keep in mind is that we are on a planet with 7.6 billion people and counting. So when we're talking about going backwards, how do you stay honest and accountable to those billions of people that weren't around and that weren't needing resources back when those techniques were dominant? So I think there's value in looking at past techniques, but they will have to be very critically reconsidered to function at a scale in a way that 
is meaningful and honors the population that like we have to serve. Yeah, I think the main the main word is reconsideration. Mm. Because we can use we can um, sometimes we're overlooking and materials that may, may have a potential to to benefit us and that they are more natural and we're just like really focusing on inventing something new. And that's what I, Maybe I, I more agree with you than we thought that maybe. <laughs> but I think it's about reconsideration and looking at potential of things because there's I'm sure that there's uh, so much natural materials that we overlooked. like Because, for example, you work with algae as well, right? And algae was existing for millions of years, and only in the past few years we really look at its potential. So I think it's it's interesting. Okay, you can also invent, but it's very interesting to also look at the past, maybe we overlooked something that can really be beautiful and beneficial. And there's definitely a danger in novelty for novelty's sake. Yeah. For sure. For sure. We have time for one more question, two more questions. Great. Yeah. Does anybody have a question? Please raise your hand high so I can see it. Hi. Um, talking about plastics, I'm just wondering, because for example, when you see the garments made out of plastic, like, um, um, you know, that you could, you know, polyester that is recyclable, basically, and that's pretty useful, and you think, oh, that's great, why, why a spit on plastic? But then when you find out that when you wash them, the microparticles go in the, in the water, and there's no way to avoid that. So my question is just more, I mean, it's great to be positive and enthusiastic, but just where does it end, and how in which way on a large scale plastic is really a solution or just a thing that we created that we don't really know how to get away from. But um, it's just this idea of like, if you want to be upcycling, it has to be a cycle that doesn't go to waste. And I'm just wondering how you approach that aspect. Well, I, I actually, I believe that all plastic that you created still exists. So for me, it's not, I always, when people are seeing my project, they say, "Oh, it's about recycling," and I, I, I don't, I don't approach plastic. Um, there's a lot of really beautiful projects about recycling, and I'm not against it at all. I think it's really nice to and great to reuse materials and not just throw away and live in this one-time, uh, uh, one like this uh, throwaway society, but. Um, I just believe that it just exi it exists in different ways. So plastic, when it gets in, for example, uh, recently, um, I started research about the garbage patch and the ecosystems that develop there. So it just reaches a different way. And this idea of like, if we if we clean the garbage patch, we're also going to ruin those new ecosystems that they have a potential. So it's like a new life for those maybe fibers or plastic materials that we, we don't need anymore, but maybe um, a new evolved uh, animal or bacteria, and they actually found um, a fungi and uh, a caterpillar that can digest PET, maybe that's the next future. So it's very, it's, it's a bit like you really need to think about it also like in the ethics of it. Like if it just becomes part of our environment, how it takes part in the environment, in if are we gonna take it again out and recycle it, are we actually ruining something new? Um, what I would tell my watch to stop telling me that I have a spam call, because those <laughs> are so much fun to get. Um, what I'll offer on that is that um, yes, recycling is broken. Um, the vast majority of plastics that have been produced were never recycled at all. Those that were recycled, the vast majority of which were not recycled again. Um, to me, I try to focus, and this is like my global affairs economics math brain, nothing is perfect. No intervention is going to be completely unproblematic. The question is, always for me relative to what and how do you how do you start where you are and have a goal of an entirely renewable entirely biodegradable material culture and know that you can't just jump straight there we're going to have to start taking steps building 
intermediate material to intermediate industries and technologies to get there and not shoot the messenger, I guess, not, not critique that first step because it's not the last step because mm -hmm. we'll never get there if we're bickering over the imperfections of the first step. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that sort of gets back to the pessimism versus uh, like optimism thing. Like there's a realism path as well that sort of tempers both of those sentiments. Yeah, I think we're more realistic than optimistic or... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's, again, it's not a perfect thing. And it's, again, uh, this um, really innocent idea of like recycling and recycling. But if you think about it, where even if a bottle was recycled, maybe the consumer wouldn't recycle it again. So it's not a magical and perfect um, uh, chain. It just like most people, they don't even know what they're recycling. And I just read a few days ago that um, the recycling company, they said that it's better to not recycle than to recycle wrong. Because for them, it's really hard uh, to take care of, of materials that are being recycled wrong. And then they just have to send it to a landfill. We have time for one more question. Hi, um, I'm just really interested in this idea of collaborating with nature. Um, and just if you have, if you can speak to that or have any advice on sort of how you approach that, whether you're looking at um, systems and landscapes and sort of the priorities of those ecological systems and landscapes and how you would intervene or intersect or collaborate with them and sort of your approach to that. I think I, I more do what is called uh, biomimicry mimicry or geomimicry. So I'm really looking um, in the systems that are happening in nature. How because nature uh, for me it's the perfect uh, it's the per perfect uh, processes and uh, systems. Um, yeah, I think I'm more inspired by nature and I'm more interested in what is happening in nature than uh, intervening in it. That's more my uh, approach. Um, my uh, so starting from a premise of climate change being the theme, starting from an observation that we already have too much carbon in the atmosphere already, and we need to be taking it down out. Um, if you ask like a room of engineers to build a carbon sequestering machine that is self-replicating, self-cleaning, potentially ecologically beneficial, and like has zero maintenance, they wouldn't be able to do it. But it already exists. It's algae. Like so that that's sort of where. There's a humility in trying to look at the natural world and look at how incredibly well adapted some organisms are to certain behaviors and how can we how can we leverage that instead of sort of back to your question, like just try to invent something new for the sake of newness. Um, so that's sort of how I would say I think about collaborating with nature is around appreciating that carbon is actually incredibly scarce on the surface of the Earth, but it's incredibly valuable for life. So life's gotten really good at managing it. So how do we leverage that um, and try to do it as responsibly and cautiously as possible? Because you can't, it's a, such a dynamic system, you can't change one thing without creating cascades elsewhere. A lovely way to end. Unfortunately, I have to bring the formal conversation to a close um, because we have another wonderful panel if anybody wants to stay and join at 3.30 with three other, at four, sorry, with three other designers from the Triennial on encouraging growth. But both Charlotte and Shahar have offered to continue the conversation in front of their projects, which are on view in the Triennial upstairs. Charlotte's um, piece is on the first floor. Shahar's is on the third. And if you're interested in further conversations around the Triennial, you can find four of them in the book, Collaborations in Design, which is available in the shop. Thank you all. Thank you.